Ghost Runner is a really good game, actually. Not because of the story or the graphics, only one of those things isn't that good, but simply the movement and combat alone propel this game to top 10 movement games easily. There's definitely issues that I'll get to, but what makes this game good makes it really, really good. Also to note, this is a really spoiler heavy review. If you just purchased this game or plan on doing so, this is your chance to back out and come back later before I spoil everything for you. I'll go ahead and start by talking about the story first, since I feel it's necessary you get some sort of rundown before I talk about the rest of the game, you start the game with no memory of who you are. All you're told is that you need to free an AI known as the Architect. Once you've done so, you learn that you live in a complex known as Dharma Tower after something happened to humanity. We never really learned specifically what happened, but it's not super important. The Architect takes you to the Cyber Void, a place where we gain abilities and can talk freely, where he explains that you're a ghost runner, technologically enhanced robots who were once used as peacekeeping units throughout the tower. You once protected the Architect as a sort of bodyguard before his control of the tower was taken from him in a coup led by Mara, a trusted confidant turned insane dictator. In this coup, you were badly damaged and fell from the upper levels of the tower all the way down into the base. Your task with helping the architect retake his tower and end Mara's evil dictatorship. As soon as you've set off, you receive a distress call over the radio from someone named Zoe asking if there are any other climbers receiving this call. You respond, much to the architect's despair, and you learn that it was the climbers who actually repaired you when you fell and that you're running nickname for the time was Jack because you were quote unquote pretty jacked up. We learned that the climbers are a group of rebels who want to climb up from the upper levels and liberate themselves from the tyranny of Mara as they're forced to do all of the labor while only those fortunate enough to be brought into the upper levels reap the benefits. While the Keymaster and her lackeys live in luxury, we basers work our fingers to the bone our whole lives and don't see any of it. This speech is somewhat interrupted by Mara, who has shut off the air filtration system in the district where rebellion against her occurred. This would eventually lead to all of the residents dying of radiation from the outside air, elderly and children first. While the architect informs us helping them would just be a waste of time, You don't have time to worry about one sector's dwindling population. You want them to die? You're missing the bigger picture here. We decide to help Zoe out anyway because she's like the only one who's been nice to us so far in the game. Once that's taken care of, we head up to Dharma City and take out one of its its main defense points along the way that stops people from getting up there in your first of three boss battles. In Dharma, we go after data on Project Ghost Runner that could help defeat Mara, but while in the Cyber Void, the data is taken from us by a fake Ghost Runner, and after tracking it down and taking back the data in our second boss battle, we get a message from Mara informing us that once we get defeated, she'll be destroying all of the remaining Cyber Void systems, which would kill the Architect. As we move through the core, Mara's true intentions are revealed, and that's modifying humans beyond a recognition so as to make them suited for the outside world's radioactive climate and thus move humanity outside of the tower. We access one last cyber void server and gain the architect's hidden ability to hack into people and control their actions. It's from there that Mara realizes we only saved the people in the district she turned the air filter off for because we're defective and have gained our own sentience somewhat. And from there, she tries to convince us that the enemy all along was actually the architect. The architect, mid-argument, forces us to ignore Mara by turning off her radio communication and it is shockingly revealed that he has, in fact, been lying to us this whole time about how much he's capable of doing. You silenced her. I couldn't stand the noise. We reach Mara and then defeat her in what I thought was a somewhat disappointing boss fight, I'll explain it later, and it's suddenly revealed that the architect, the guy who was like, yeah, thousands of women and children dying isn't really my problem, was actually also a bad person all along. Whoa, who would have thought? He tries to take control and ultimately deactivate the ghost runner, and after a lot of platforming and running down corridors, we come face to face with the architect. Kill him, and the epilogue plays out where Zoe narrates to us that humanity is no longer ruled by two insane people and that they're now free to make their own decisions moving forward. Finally, we get a last glimpse of the Ghost Runner coming back online and the credits roll. Overall, the story isn't bad, but I definitely didn't really care too much about it, especially because it's really not the main focus of the game. The Architect being a second villain isn't really that much of a twist considering he has been consistently not a good person throughout the entire story. There are multiple moments where you are reminded that this dude is not a good person and that you should not like him. You are immune to this affliction. You are not conditioned to put the needs of the few 
over the needs of the many. However, that's not that important because as you've already probably noticed by watching the gameplay in the background, the main focus of this game is the movement and combat. The movement is insanely well done. Platforming can get a little quirky in certain areas, especially in the cyber void, but running, dashing, wall running, jumping, grappling, air dodging, and sliding all feel so, so great to do and feel satisfying when chained together correctly. I mean, you're literally just Genji without a double jump. It's really hard to mess this up. The only way you you could fail is if the combat sucked, which is why I'm so happy to say the combat is so good. It's one of the few games that has made me smile while playing it because of what I was doing. Chaining your movement with your sword strikes, deflecting bullets, using your abilities all feel so good. There was like one ability that had a bit of a rough start and a really weird tutorial. Okay, so for Blink, the first real ability you're given, the tutorial is set up in a really finicky way and it doesn't really show how you use Blink in gameplay. Okay, but like, am I doing this wrong? All the other ones are fine though, but nothing really beats just straight up rushing people and the satisfaction you get when you don't die because of it. Speaking of which, the difficulty is a little bit on the hard side. Sometimes the enemies do just a little bit of a modding. Fuck you. What? Fuck you. <laughs> but overall, it's a very fair challenge. There's only a small selection of times that I felt like a death was the game's fault and not my own. You are given the tools to deal with these enemies. All you have to do is use them correctly. The death counter at the end of the level is genius, and seeing my friend's scores compared to mine can either push me to be better or make me feel really, really bad for a friend who had a rough time. Oh my god. <laughs> This poor man. The levels in the game are all very well made. I don't think there's like a super specific level in the game where I can just be like, yeah, this one is the worst outside of some boss fights. I mean, I'll get to it later. From grappling to zip lining and everything in between, everything manages to feel fluid and pushes you towards a certain direction. There's a surprising amount of detail, but there were only a few times that I got just a tiny bit confused at where I was supposed to go or what I was supposed to do. Honestly, the most notable of this is the cyber void. In this room specifically with the first weird puzzle you do, there are these slightly transparent looking platforms that took me like 30 seconds to notice because they just blend in with the rest of the room. And also like the waypoint after you're done clearing a room of enemies, it's a little on the less noticeable side. I'd rather have it just be a bit bigger or a bit more obnoxious on the screen to really know where I'm going, but it's it's nitpicking, it's nitpicking. The cyber void itself is either a really fun place to be in or really annoying for no reason. Like you can go from really cool optical illusions to doing this weird weird spinning block course that doesn't always work correctly with the movement in the game. The best done level in the game for me was definitely the crawler level. The way the constant music you're so used to is cut out what the level design works to create a really creepy atmosphere. You're only given glimpses of the new enemy being revealed before they suddenly rush you and you learn that they're the only enemies in the game that can actually run on walls to chase you and that if you get near them, they just blow up, forcing you to find either creative ways to kill them or to avoid them. In contrast, the worst done level is easily the final boss. I finally talk about it. I am so disappointed with how it was handled. And honestly, even the second boss was handled. These might as well be cutscenes. You spend the entire game building yourself up and upgrading and becoming this unstoppable badass with so many options for movement and combat that you can kill any enemy you come across with ease if used correctly. But for the final boss, main antagonist of the game, you sit still and play jump rope until she electrocutes herself and then you just cut her three times. Same with the second boss fight, honestly. A chance to have a battle with what is meant to be an equal to a ghost runner, but instead it's pretty much just a quick time event. Imagine if Ultra Kills V2 was just a quick time event. I see no reason why we couldn't have just fought for real. Fighting against an enemy that matches me in movement and abilities would be sick and a great test of how far the player has come so far. But sitting here, hand off my keyboard and pressing left click five times is definitely not what I expected. The only boss fight I actually enjoyed was against Tom, the laser defense grid, and that's because his fight was a test of how good you are with your movement as of this point. Dodging lasers, grappling, wall running, and jumping off of and onto walls again as you climb up gradually made for a really fun boss fight that I would have liked to see topped by later bosses instead of that being the peak. 
Also, just as a fun side note, there's a lot of Easter eggs baked into the levels of this game. I won't spoil all of them, but here's the motorcycle from Akira. Now to end off, I'll go ahead and end talking about something positive, the soundtrack. Almost all of these songs are bangers and having them play in the background while parkouring around slashing enemies is the cherry on top to a great experience. I have no specific standout tracks, but every single one played works in the game, and I only felt that every single event in the game I experienced was enhanced with music and nothing detracted. Overall, that's what I thought about Ghost Runner. If you liked the video, I'd recommend subscribing and checking out my other videos about Ultra Kill and Bad North. If you're interested in buying Ghost Runner for yourself, it's $30 on Steam, and the link is in the description below. It's overall worth the purchase like tenfold, and the things I took issue with can be overlooked if you get immersed enough. But I'll definitely be replaying it a few times before before I move on to a different game.